Good morning. Good morning. I greet you in the name of the Lord and welcome you to the experience of the love of Christ being shared through us. You may be seated if you choose. Remember to take a moment and register your presence on the red bottle folder. This is so important because we do acknowledge your being here and us being together. By the way, before we go any further, I'm going to ask Roger Reiners to make an announcement about next Sunday. <clears throat> next Sunday on October 27th, we'll be highlighting the mission activity of our church. The various mission projects will be on display and Bruce Bloomer will be here with us uh, to tell of his work in Haiti where he's building a medical clinic. And those of you that have been leading a mission project will find information in your mailboxes about the displays. And if we've missed anybody, just uh, give us a call and let us know. So if you have any questions, you can just give us a call. Thank you, Roger. And next Sunday is really a Sunday to look forward to because Dr. Boomer will be a tremendous speaker. And then, if you've never seen the display of our church's outreach, you'll want to see it for sure next Sunday because in, the, in this fellowship hall, each organization that represents some of our outreach will have a presentation. It's, it's really enlightening and encouraging. All right. If you are worshiping with us, maybe for the first time, you'll notice that inside of our worship guide, there are some aids to worship so that you can read them and see if they will be helpful to you. And if you are with us for the first time, stop the welcome center. We have a gift that we would like to leave with you for the privilege of sharing worship together. Then at the bottom of that inside page of a paragraph names, that pertains to our ministry of caring. And just update a few things. A uh, memorial service for Agnes Burdick was held here in this church yesterday. And as a matter of fact, the flowers that are right there in front of the pulpit were given for us to remember and honor Agnes. And uh, Rick Schwen had gallbladder surgery this past week. He's recovering quite well, but that's just an update on some of the things that are happening in our church. You have several, in, you have two inserts today. The, the black on white is our regular church announcements. Read them very carefully so you know what is happening and you can be very informed. The one on color paper that pertains to the youth and, and that, so read that so you're also very informed. And then I have an announcement here that is not in the bulletin. The fourth grade Sunday school class We'll be doing a bake sale on the 9th of November at Levy Drug. It will be from 10.30 to 12, that's a Saturday. And this will be uh, to help with the ARC. Now, I'm getting all kinds of wishes and suggestions and bad mouthing because I get blamed for the rain, you know, and they think that if I don't quit pretty soon, uh, they're going to need an art, but anyway, this is not that kind of art. This is a Sunday school program art. But anyway, that bake sale by the fourth grade is for the 9th of November at Levy Drug, and if you would like to donate, they will need it to be delivered here the night before. And uh, well, for information, call Lisa Mommy. That's the best thing. Go to Lisa and just get the information that you need. One more thing, Pastor Andy's not with us today. He's taking off the weekend for some R, and R will be back this evening or tomorrow. Let's stand and say good morning to the people that are around us. Point two. Good morning.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I don't know about you, but I am so glad to be here, and I'm glad that you're here. I'd like to start this time with a word of prayer. Dear Father God, we come home today as a glad receiver. of your mercy, your love, your grace. We're here to declare there is nobody like you, nobody close, and our desire is to worship you. We want to worship you in spirit and truth, as the King of kings and as the Lord of lords. We thank you and we praise you for who you are, what you've already done, what you're going to do. You deserve all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. We acknowledge your presence in this place and in us as believers. In Jesus' name, amen.
the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. We've been talking about seeding, sowing, and harvest this morning. So if you want a real harvest, sow the seed of God, the word of God, into your hearts. Generously. That's where the fruit will come. Please say this with me in this song. I wait for the Lord. He waits. And in his word, I put my Yeah. 
Father, we do come before you this morning with the desires of our heart. We thank you for your great love for each and every one of us, and that you were willing to send your only begotten Son to this earth, that we might have eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And that should be the greatest delight of our heart, to know you as Lord and Savior for each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather freely together this morning to sing praises and to worship you because you are a great and an awesome and a loving God and that you have provided a way of salvation for us. It's a free gift that all we have to do is to accept this gift which you give to us. We thank you for this building and how we can gather together, Lord. Well, we thank you most of all that it's not this building that makes it a church, but it's each and every one of us that is here, each attendee to our other services also, that we are the church, we as people are the church, not a building. And it's the church that you love, not the building, but the people in it. And you care for each and every one of us. We thank you for our pastors who lead us, for Pastor Andy and Pastor DeBurn. We thank you for them and their faithfulness in serving you. And just pray that you'll continue to be with and lead and guide them as they are the ultimate leaders of this church. We thank you for each other commission that is serving you in this church too, Lord, and that each one of us may feel that we are a part and that we make this church what it is. We thank you for our other churches too, that are in our close proximity for Parkview, Big Stone, and Ortonville. As all of us as Methodist churches strive to serve you, Lord. We praise you and thank you for our farmers and the harvest that is taking place right now. And we would ask for your safety for each and every one of them as they are bringing in the crops, Lord. And we thank you that you are in control of the rain and the sunshine and not each of us. We praise you for that, that you provide and that you do take care of us. Father God, we also have requests to bring to you as there are several people who continue to need your healing touch, continue to think of Rick, Schwen, Lord, Esther Cooper, Peter Mogard, Oliver Rad, Jim Weber, and for Kennedy Sailor that you continue to be with her and the issues that she's facing, Lord. And we thank you for Denise Page and her recovery, for Lois Koopman. Thank you that Roger Reiner's eye is better, Lord. We thank you for your healing touch there. Pray that you'll continue to be with Velma Davis, Jackson Weber. Ken and Mavis Canals, Shirley Pauly, Alice Lindquist, and Art Jacobson, Lord, may you bring your healing touch upon them. And also for Marlon Schultz and Mary Weary, Father God, just continue to be with Anne and Danica Schulte and their particular needs. We have so many requests to bring to you, Lord, and we thank you that you hear them and that you care about each and every one of them. Continue to uphold the family of Agnes Burdick too, and their loss in Agnes, Lord, and the bereavement in that family that you will just watch over them, be their strength, be their guide. And all these people who are facing various issues, whether it be cancer or surgeries, that you will just be with them, be their strength. Thank you so much that you are always there for us, no matter what time of day and night, that we can come to you with requests that weigh heavily upon our hearts. We thank you that for the military personnel who are serving in faraway countries, Lord, and for also our local National Guards and those that are serving you in this way. We praise you for that. We praise you for the freedom that we have to gather here this morning and to worship and thank you for your great love. Father God, we thank you also for the prayer which you taught us in your word 
in your word and its truth for each and every one of us. And as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, which you taught to us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite our boys and girls to come and join me up here. And let's sing that little invitation that we sing. Okay? This, this is where children belong. Welcome, that's part of the worshiping wrong. Oh, I hear God's word, bread and cup, prayer and song. This is where children belong. This, this is where children belong. Welcome, that's part of the worshiping wrong. Oh, I hear God's word, bread and cup, prayer and song. Did I share that with you, bud? Sure, okay. Good morning, everybody. How you doing here? Hey, it's great to see you up here. I want to talk about gifts. Do you like to receive gifts? We do, don't we? And do you like to give gifts? Yes, we do. Okay. But how do you, what's the right spirit in getting gifts? Let's use a little illustration here, okay? Yes? Hmm. Well, let's use a little illustration here. Let's say somebody gave you a gift of ten candy bars. That's a pretty big gift for a little kid, right? Yeah. Well, would you receive it? If they, if they offered it to you as a gift, would you receive it? Yes. Sure you would. Why not? They, they want to give it to you, and they're trying to tell you they like you, but, and you want to let them know. Now, do you just grab it and say, this is mine, and just run off and hide it, you know, or something? Okay, so what, 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 how do you respond? What should we do? You say, thank you. That's right, you should show gratitude. But, is there any other way that you can express gratitude other than saying, thank you? You can say you love the gift. You know, there's one other. You can smile. There you go. And there's one other way. You know, you got 10 candy bars here. What if you would take one of them and offer it back to the person that gave it? You know? You would have nine. <laughs> Oh, well, you're spoiling my message, though. You said it'd be even nicer if you gave me five. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, but that's the way, isn't it? You take, you got ten gifts, so you take one part of it and you offer it back because that really tells you how much you appreciate what they're giving. Now, the thing is, you had ten. You give one back, you only got nine. Is that bad? No. no. It's nine more than you had to begin with, right? Now, boys and girls, here's, here's, here's the story I'm trying to tell you. Everything we have is a gift from God. You know, the fact that we're here and we're alive and we've got 
health and we've got homes and we've got food to eat and, and all of these, yes, it's all a gift from God. And God wants us to have the freedom to express appreciation. So out of every 10 units that God gives us, he invites us to give one back to him. Like, if I was to get a dollar, he asked me to give 10 cents back to him. If I get $10, I'll give one back to him. Because that's my saying, how much I appreciate I was saying thank you and I love you and smile. There you go. And I tell you, this guy is a clown. That's okay. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you that you have given us life and you're so good to us, but we thank you also that you let us tell you we thank you for what you give us. Show us, Lord, how to be people with a generous, thankful heart. Amen. Now, I ask you a question. Would you be angry toward me if I offered you a gift of a candy bar? You wouldn't? You wouldn't? Would your mom and dad be angry toward me? Oh, forgive that. It's too far. Okay, you got a red one or a dark one? Take one, and that's my gift to you. You are. <laughs> this morning our scripture kind of follows the same theme. It's taken from 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 15. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you, because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I want to place a problem before us for our resolution this morning. Go with me back to biblical times, and the reason I suggest that is because I need for us to find a location in antiquity, and we've got a little bit of knowledge about biblical times, so let's use our imagination there. It's a time of the year when the farmer is preparing to plant his seed for his harvest. Last year's harvest was not a good harvest because of a drought. As a matter of fact, in order to gather enough grain together to keep the family fed, they had to spend just about all of the money that the families had in reserve. And now, there is hope for a harvest because the rains have come. It's about time to seed the ground. But, 
there is so little grain left to stretch out the needs, meet the needs of the family until the new harvest comes that for days and weeks and maybe even a month the family has had to go hungry and just eating enough to get by. And the family is weary from it. Because in the storeroom there's that other bag of seed that has not been touched. And it could help to squelch some of those hunger pains. But it hasn't been touched because for the farmer, that is the seed that he is going to plant for the next harvest. But as you know how, hunger pains can get the best. And the family is saying, forget the harvest. Let's just eat what we've got. As long as it lasts, we're just tired of being hungry. What should the farmer do? Does the subject of biblical stewardship create some anxieties for us? Do we recoil when the subject of giving is addressed within the church? Some churches have found that during a stewardship drive in the fall, their Sunday worship attendance has dropped until they have completed the emphasis on stewardship. I'm reminded of the story of the strongman show at the traveling carnival. To the audience that had gathered, the strongman showed his strength by taking this lemon and squeezing every bit of moisture out of it. And when he had convinced everybody that he had squeezed everything out of it there was, they invited people from the audience to come up and see if they could squeeze anything else out of it. And if they could, they would give them a hundred dollars and several rather strong men gave it a try, but no, sir. I mean, there just was no more moisture left in that lemon. Finally, a rather small and thin looking man stepped forward and asked if he could give it a try. And so they gave him the lemon and he took the lemon in his right hand and he took a glass in his left and he held the lemon up over the glass and he began to squeeze and he squeezed another quarter of a glass of moisture out of that lemon. And people were just absolutely amazed. And they asked him how he had ever acquired such unbelievable strength. And he just calmly replied that he was the treasurer of the local United Methodist Church and he was used to squeezing juice out of reluctant lemons. <laughs> now I personally think that in some cases both the church and the parishioners have, could choose a better way of addressing stewardship in a more appropriate manner. Take, for example, how church leaders go about addressing the subject of stewardship. Some parishioners have complained that there is so much emphasis on money in their particular church that they have begun to almost wonder if that is the main mission of the church. Other parishioners have felt that they almost feel intimidated that there is so much heavy-handed and constant emphasis on giving more to the church. Now people we all know that without sufficient funds, the local church and its mission are simply not going to exist. But from a biblical perspective, I don't think that it is appropriate for parishioners to feel harassed as the church tries to meet its financial responsibilities. Paul, under the counsel of the Holy Spirit, wrote, Every man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or of compulsion, because for God loves a cheerful giver. Now Paul advised that people be given the freedom to give willingly as they might choose to give. The opportunity, the need should be presented, and then... People should be invited to give out of their heart of love. 
Now, naturally, if people choose not to respond, then the church is not going to be able to continue to carry on some of the ministries that they have slated because the funds will just simply not be there that are necessary. And if and when this should happen in a particular local church, what God will do is he will take his gift and his blessing that he had initially intended for that particular church and he will take it and he will give it to another church. And if they will take it and begin to respond to it in love and faith, he will then direct his blessing and his empowerment to that church for the fulfillment of what he has designed. Still, a congregation should never be harassed over giving, even if that congregation is traditionally reluctant to be givers. Well, let's consider what might be a more appropriate approach for presenting the subject of stewardship. When Paul addressed the subject of stewardship, he used a couple of basic premises which are both biblical and practical. And the first premise that Paul used was that God owns everything. Whatever it is that we have, no matter how we use the terminology, we say, I own that, I earn that. You know, that's common language, isn't it? But actually, whatever it is that we have that is for our benefit, it is something that God has loaned to us. Paul was explaining to that congregation in Corinth the necessity of funds for the kind of a ministerial outreach that Paul was interested in. Still, Paul never once approached the subject of giving as if it meant that they were supposed to give something that belonged to them. Paul's approach always was that they might choose to direct and distribute something that God had just loaned to them on a temporary basis, they might choose to direct it toward the ministry that Paul was referring to, and that might also cooperate with the Holy Spirit speaking to them and giving them a special love and an interest in that kind of a ministry. So even though Paul could speak and argue very convincingly that the ministry that he was referring to was very important. Never once did Paul suggest that those people in Corinth ought to cough up money toward his cause. Paul just consistently invited them to ask themselves if they wanted to participate with God in the ministry that God had designed for the glory of God, and for the benefit of those that chose to cooperate with God. You know, one of the things that is quite common today, and it works quite successfully, is what we call the program of matching funds. We've seen it many times. Somebody will give a certain amount of money toward a cause, and then and he'll give it on, the, he or she'll give it on the, the basis of a matching fund, so that it you and I give so many dollars toward that same cause, they take an equal amount out of that, so what we give then doubles. All the matching funds program. Do you know where the idea for matching funds came from? It was God's idea. Listen to how Paul was talking, in my opinion, about matching funds when he wrote about the Corinthian to the Corinthian church. Listen, he said, remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind what you will give. That will protect you from sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. You know the law relating to sowing and reaping is a God-designed law. And that law is so deeply embedded into human nature in every form that even the most simple-minded individual understands it. And it's a universal law. 
The law of sowing and reaping relates to relationships. It relates to our association with God. It relates to how we function here in this physical world. Now to exercise our love for God and God's kingdom work, then we should be willing to delight in giving this if we understand the law of giving, of sowing and reaping. Because when God comes alongside of us and says, do you want to help me here? And we choose to get alongside of him. That means we and God are cooperating in his cause. And God then turns around and begins to walk with us and assist us in those things that are so important to us. Again, listen to Paul's explanation. He said, God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything, more than just doing what needs to be done. As one psalmist put it, he throws caution to the wind, giving to the needy in reckless abandon his right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. Someone might raise a justifiable question. And the question is, everything you're saying, Paul said, sounds very convincing, but what about the person that has no faith in God, no commitment to the cause of God, has no desire to live according to the directives of God, and still they have accumulated a great amount of material wealth? That's a justifiable question. And I cannot answer it. I can give you philosophies. I can give you my opinion. But I can't honestly answer it because I do not understand God that well. I can choose to trust God and obey Him for myself. Still, what I can do is when I look at the different forms of of wealth, I realize that not all wealth is wrapped up into material gifts. Would you allow me to use a personal story? Three weeks ago today, I was not here in church. As a matter of fact, three weeks ago today, while some of you were in church, I wasn't in church. And the reason was, instead of being in church, we were all in our son and daughter-in-law's living room. See, the, the evening before, I had performed my grandson's wedding. And our son and our two daughters and their spouses and most of our grandchildren were all together. And we really wanted to get together as a family and have some family time together. And the only time was Sunday morning, and so that's what we did. And as I sat there and listened to my children and their spouses as they shared one with another, I began to realize how fortunate I was. There was no tension between these families. There was nothing but interest and love and appreciation and outreach. And, and they just welcomed each other. And, and it was just the warmest and the most delightful time and place to be. And then while we were in that time of being together, our grandson and his new bride stepped into the room from out of doors. And just like that, one of our grandsons spoke up and said something like, you know, if you're going to be a part of this family, you might get used to being religious because we pray a lot and we talk about God a lot and we just believe in reaching out and loving each other. You might as well get used to it. Folks, here's what I'm leading up to. Every time I reflect back on what I experienced that Sunday morning as our family was together, I feel like a rich man. I feel like God has blessed me beyond any way that I can describe it. There was a day that I was privileged to talk to a man who had accumulated a tremendous amount of material possessions. He said to me, he said, I imagine that I have acquired and hold within my possession more material wealth than you can even imagine. And I didn't argue. 
because I think he did. But we spent a considerable amount of time that day just talking. We talked about values. We talked about objectives. We talked about our families. We talked about our marriages. We talked about our faith in God. We talked about what was going to happen to us when we die. We, we just talked about everything. And finally, that, that man looked at me and said, Preacher, let me tell you, I possess more than you'll ever imagine. But if I could, I would trade even up with you right now. I'd give you what I've got for what you've got. By the way, we didn't trade. <laughs> Part of the reason was I wasn't about to give up what God's given me. Let's go back to the story of the farmer that started the sermon. He's got this dilemma. He's got this bag of seed waiting to be planted. But his family is hungry. They're just tired of their stomachs gnawing, wanting more food. What is he supposed to do? They're saying, let's just eat and enjoy it while it lasts. He's tired of waiting. How is he supposed to reason through the dilemma? Well, there's one thing that he cannot escape any more than you and I can escape it. And that is the laws of sowing and reaping. Those laws are locked into every single part and phase and level of our lives. And there's no bending of those laws. And there's no escaping of those laws. Whether it's in relationship with people, whether it's in relationship with God, whether it's in relationship with our earth, no matter what it is and everything, each one of us holds a seed. And what we do with that seed will determine what's going to be the outcome. And there is no way, there is absolutely no way that that farmer can even begin to hope to feed his family without the planting of the seed. And there is no way that you and I can ever hope to fill the, 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 the demands and the hungers of our hearts and our lives and our relationships unless we are willing to plant the seeds that God has given to us. I'd suggest that we take time to read the rest of the text that Shiva read to us this morning. And Paul, when he says that, he is saying, I'm not just talking about putting money toward a project, as good as it is. I'm talking about finding the freedom of trust, whereby we invest in God's work. And the thing is, it will affect every single part of our lives. When we learn by faith in God to begin to practice the spirit of generosity, the planting of the seeds that God has put within our possessions, Paul said, your whole life will be blessed. Your whole life will be enriched. You know, I call that living first class. Amen. Let's worship by giving tithes and offerings.
this past week in providing ministry, I was given the question that I've heard many times before, and I wouldn't be surprised you have heard it also. And the question was, if God is as great as he's supposed to be, if God cares as much about us as he's supposed to, then why doesn't God fix this? Well, I can't answer some of God's questions. But you know, I do know this. There are some times when we're waiting for God to fix things and God is waiting for us to take the seed he's already given us and plant it. And that's when you and I need to help each other sometimes. We need to help each other to have the trust in God where we dare to plant the seed God's put in our hands so God can begin to bring the harvest that we're hoping.